Greetings, I'm the dentist. Welcome back to Dent Agenda. This is Chapter 3, Pediatric Dentistry. In this tutorial, you will learn all about stainless steel crowns. These are the points we are going to cover. Firstly, take a look on the history of stainless steel crowns. Stainless steel crowns were introduced by Humphrey to the pediatric dentistry in 1950, and since then it is used for the treatment of primary teeth that are badly broken. Now, regarding the metal these crowns are made of, well, of course, as the name suggests, they are made of stainless steel, and some other crowns are nickel based Stainless steel crowns are known as a semi-permanent restoration that can be used in a primary and young permanent molars, and they are available in different types. Number one, pre-trimmed crowns. These crowns have straight, non-contoured sides. However, they are decorated to follow a line corresponding to the gingival crest. Number two, pre-contoured crowns. These crowns are contoured to follow the contours of the tooth. And number three, pre-veneered crowns. These are treated steel crowns that have gum-based composite clung to their clusal and buccal surfaces to make a more aesthetic appearance. Now, before you commence the procedure of placing a stainless steel crown, there are different factors that you should consider. Starting with the age and cooperation of your patient, the motivation of the patient, the medical condition and the presence of any metal allergies. Stainless steel crowns have many advantages. Number one, they are clinically acceptable by both dentists and patients. Number two, their resistance, retention, replacement and lifespan of a stainless steel crown is preferred over the amalgam restoration. Number three, they are inexpensive and durable. Number four, they are adjustable. Number five, they offer full inclusion for the tooth, ensuring that it remains secure. Number six, they are the best treatment and the treatment of choice for the children who need general anesthesia. And number seven, the tooth can still be restored even if there is insufficient tooth structure remained. On the other hand, the disadvantages of stainless steel crowns are the anesthetic appearance, and in a partially erupted tooth, it cannot be used. Now to the worst part, which are the complications you may face placing a stainless steel crown. Number one, crown tilt. That can happen due to the presence of caries or a badly destructed buccal or lingual walls. In these cases, you should use a restoration to build the crown up before placing the crown. Number two, interproximal ledge. If the bare angulation is not given correctly, then a ledge will be delivered rather than a shoulder-free interproximal cut. Failure to remove this ledge will bring about trouble in seeding the crown. Number three, crown inhalation or ingestion. Till cementation, proper isolation using rubber dam should be placed because the cough reflex present in children will make more chances for the crown to be ingested or inhaled. If this happens, the child should be held upside down as quickly as possible. This will result in the removal of the crown. If this is insufficient, Clinical referral is advised for a quick chest and abdomen radiograph. 
If the crown remains in the lung or bronchi, then it can be expelled by bronchoscopy. And if it was ingested, it will be defecated. Number four, poor margins. Marginal integrity is decreased if the crown is ineffectively adjusted to the margins. That will result in recurrent caries, increased gingivitis and plaque retention. When not to use a stainless steel crown? Well, in the following cases. Number one, if a primary molar is about to exfoliate, where the radiograph shows more than half the primary tooth resorbed. Number two, in uncooperative patients. Number three, in patients who are, are allergic to nickel. And number four, in case of grade three mobility. When you're done with the treatment, never leave the patient without post-treatment instructions that include precautions taken by the child not to bite their tongue, cheeks, lips due to the effect of the anesthesia. A mild painkiller can be given to the child by the dentists so that when the numbness has worn off, some discomfort may be experienced. Also, instruct the patient to stay away from sticky foods for three to four days after crown insertion so that the cement underneath gets time to harden. Brushing and flushing should always be done. Indications of stainless steel crowns. They are indicated to cover badly broken down primary molars or those with large fillings that are prone to constant fracture. Also, to cover teeth after pulp therapy in primary molars. As a provisional measure for secondary molars, where crowns are required but the patient is still too young for a permanent crown. Or as a temporary coverage during preparation of cast crowns for premolars or secondary molars. Also, they are advised to be used in cases of developmental anomalies and in case of severe tooth loss due to bruxism or erosion. Now to the armamentarium and the instruments you need to prepare. High-speed handpiece, high-speed tapered diamond bear and diamond occlusal wheel, straight handpiece and stone, low speed handpiece and burrs, crown scissors, dividers to help you select the suitable crown, Adams pliers, Jones stone contouring pliers and a bell pliers. They are useful but not essential. Now to the techniques you can use to place your stainless steel crowns. There are two principal methods for placement the conventional technique and the hull technique. Starting with the conventional technique, in which the stainless steel crowns rely for retention only on a tight adaptation at the gentle margin of the preparation. Therefore, taper off preparation walls is not critical. If possible, local anesthesia and rubber dam would be helpful. Note that the tooth should be free of any caries. Use dividers to measure the mesodestal dimension of the crown and that can help in the crown selection. Occlusal reduction. You need to reduce the occlusal surface by about 1 mm, roughly following the cuspal planes. Approximal reduction is about 20 degrees from the vertex, using tapered diamond bear without producing ledges at the gingival margin so the margin should be shoulder-free. Removal of the buccal and lingual pulposity is only sufficient to seat the crown. Often, there is little or no reduction is required. Now to the crown selection. Let the mesodestal dimensions of the real crown guide you to choose the correct size. And to make sure, you should try it on the tooth. 
the correct crown size will produce a click sound when fitted. Check the height and occlusion. Minor prematurity is not a problem, but if extensive blanching of the surrounding tissues or overextension of the crown, trim the crown first, but usually it is not necessary. Use the pliers to adapt the contact points and fold the margins and smooth the trimmed margins using the stone. Cement the crown using zinc polycarboxylate or glass enamel cement. The child bite on the cement filled crown down into place for a couple of minutes. Placing a cotton roll or a biting stick can help. Then remove the excess cement after sitting and that trapped interproximally should be removed using a dental floss. Note that the technique is the same for both primary and secondary molars, but in secondary molars, more careful adjustment is necessary. Now to the second technique, hull technique. It is taught as the gold standard for restoring primary molars with distal or mesial caries. No conventional preparation or caries removal is normally carried out and is referred to by advocates as a biological technique, which is opposite to conventional. After simply removing any loose debris, a crown is cemented over the caries unprepared molar with the child biting the cement-filled crown down into place. That technique has several potential advantages, and it may allow effective treatment for children who might otherwise be unable to accept conventional interventions. Local anesthesia is not usually required, and it is quicker than conventional stainless steel crown placement. Advocates of the technique suggest that it achieves a coronal seal, cuts off carious lesion from the substrate and protects the bulb from chemical, thermal and mechanical insults. It is recommended that its use is restricted to asymptomatic teeth with no evidence of pulpal inflammation, necrosis or periodontal involvement. Continuing in the Hull technique. Separators placement a few days before may aid in the crown placement since we do not prepare the crown at all. Check that the carious primary molar is free from any obvious pulpal or periridicular pathology. Select the correct crown size and fill it with a suitable cement. Glass enamel cement is recommended. Advise the child and the parent that the patient may feel pushing when seating the crown. Get the child to bite down on the crown to set it into place and clear away any excess cement after sitting. The crown is more likely to be in premature occlusion, but as long as this is not cross, occlusion usually evens out by dental alveolar compensation within a few weeks. We can conclude that a number of studies have demonstrated that both conventional and whole techniques of crowns have a far superior longevity to other conventional restorations in primary teeth. And there you have it all. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. I'd like to have you here for more videos. And follow us on Instagram at Dented Gender for extra tips and tricks.